Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Printed Circuit Podcast, where we will discuss trends, challenges, and opportunities across the printed circuit engineering industry. I'm your host, Steph Chavez. Today, we welcome Wilfred Wessel and Rod Dzinski on the show. Can you give us a brief introduction? Rod, we'll start with you. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Rod Dzinski. I'm the uh, market development manager in the uh, Siemens EDA division. I work on the uh, high-speed products for board-level design and system design. Great. Wilfred? My name is Wilfred Wessler. I have been an expert in Siemens EDA software for over a decade. For over three years, I'm now focusing on power electronics with an emphasis on power modules. For this reason, I put together a flow that enhanced the current design and verification processes used in the industry. That's great. Definitely got two experts today with us. What are we going to talk about? And our main topic for today is power modules or power electronics, but power modules specifically. A power module is a high power switching circuit used in electric vehicles, renewable energy, wind, and many more applications. Today's predominant switching structures are insulated gate bipolar transistors or IGBT or metal oxide semiconductors or MOS field effect transistors. Before we get into the technical details, can you share some exciting facts about power modules? Rod? I guess the first thing everybody should know is power electronics are required for just about everything, every electronic product that uh, you have around your home or your work or just about every industry today. A lot of the current interest is right now is around the uh, transportation sector, especially this electric vehicles or personal e-mobility products, everything from electric skateboards, electric bikes, all these kinds of personal e-mobility kinds of products. Power modules are really used to convert electricity from one form to another. For instance, DC current that may be coming out of a battery, convert that into AC current that really is the heart of the power electronics that are in many of these products. Today, over 70% of electricity is processed by some form of power electronics and or power modules. In the case of uh, the EV market, which is really driving a lot of the technology and investment, it's really being driven by a a lot of these rapidly approaching governmental mandates to reduce uh, CO2 emissions and just uh, an outright ban on internal combustion engines or vehicles. And one of the major, I guess, uh, power electronic components that we're going to talk about today is something we call the traction inverter, which is a part of the power electronics package that's inside the power module that resides in these vehicles. It turns out that a well-designed, efficient power module design really impacts several major system-level value propositions, things like you know, battery size, the weight, the ability to cool the vehicle, the vehicle range, and of course, the cost. And these are all really top-level value propositions that many of the electric vehicle vendors and manufacturers, this is how they sell their product and how they differentiate themselves in the market. So now I understand that EVs are a huge market driver for power modules. Are there any other applications where power modules are used? Yeah, it's important to mention that power modules are scalable from a couple of watts to megawatts. For this reason, you can say they are found everywhere in the market. There are other needs for power conversion in the electrical vehicle like onboard chargers and the electronic power for things like air condition, heaters, the entertainment center stack, and so on. But by far the most important is the inverter that is part of the electrified drivetrain, as Rod mentioned. The application of power modules call for a widespread usage in power supply. These power supply provide power to specialize the functionalities required for fast charging of the batteries, the UPS system, motor controls for AC and DC. These power supplies and their fast changing technologies are often called power conditioning units or switched mode power supplies. In a switched mode power supply, the voltages and currents are switched to shape and control the power to match the load requirements. Power modules seem to be everywhere. Can you give a simple uh, classification? The best way to think about this is really two basic types of power conversion. There's something that's called power to power conversion. And the second one is power to motion converters. A typical example of a power to power conversion would be something like what's used in renewable energy sources like solar or wind, where 
DC current that's being generated, let's say by a wind turbine or a solar panel, is being converted into AC current that can then be fed back into the power grid. The second one is power to motion converters. And this is where um, a power module is used to actually create some type of motion via electric motor. A good example of that, again, would be electric vehicle, where the power that's stored in the a battery pack, the DC current is converted into AC current, which is used to really power the different facilities in the car, the heating, the cooling, the windows, and especially the electrified drivetrain, which is used for vehicle propulsion. When you look at the underlying technology used for the implementation of these power modules, it involves typically a high temperature plastic housing where a, a ceramic base plate is mounted inside that. They use a variety of different uh, you know, manufacturing technologies. Direct bonded copper layering is, is one that's common today, where we take uh, bare power transistors, power diodes, various insulators, bond wires for connection, copper bus bars to kind of move the, the power off the module and into the system. These are all kind of encapsulated in various ways with various gels that are used to help with the thermal management and improve reliability of the, of the power module itself. Interesting. Can you put your work in the context of government CO2 reduction policies? Well, sure. I think everybody's pretty much aware of effects of climate change. You know, governments across the globe have all pledged to meet this 2050 uh, target to, to eliminate internal combustion engines. There's a few critical milestones that are quickly uh, coming on upon us. Uh, the next one is in 2025, followed by one in 2030 and 2035. And by that time, we're going to see the electric vehicle market has really taken off. Currently, it's a market that's growing at a healthy rate of, of about uh, 26% uh, CAGR. And that's through you know, the end of 2026. And what's happening here is that it's really transforming the, the entire transportation industry which then implies that, you know, there's going to be significant technology paradigm shift away from, you know, internal combustion engines and diesel engines toward electric. You know, as a result, there's going to have to be new technologies that have to be developed and in many cases just discovered. And as a result, the supply chains that are in place today are going to have to evolve to reflect its ever-changing consumer likes and dislikes. And so there is an urgency for these companies to especially in the, in the transportation sectors where, you know, they're looking for a way to kind of offer a unique e-mobility technology and the demand for that, you know, couldn't be higher right now. So the table stakes are pretty high. You know, if you're one of these companies trying to make this uh, transition to electrification, it's almost a, an all-in kind of bet here. Either you're going to make it or you're not. And many of these companies are either going to make it or they're likely to go out of business. So, as these companies try to figure out how to successfully navigate this paradigm shift, they find themselves in this need to kind of create maybe even um, new market positions, stronger mar market positions, things that uh, may not have been offered to, uh, available to them in the past. So this whole impact of e-mobility uh, as it becomes mainstream is going to be a, a really big deal as we uh, look forward here in the next several years. Ah, very interesting indeed. Very interesting. Wilford, I know you're from Munich in Germany. Can you share some personal experiences? If you're out of Munich and you're driving a diesel car, so you really have a problem. So there is a three-stage plan to reduce the nitrogen dioxide threshold in Munich. What Rod mentioned that for the other the countries, it maybe starts in 2025. In Munich, this already started at February 1st. So all diesel vehicles with an emission standard uh, worse than five are banned from the Munich city center. And of course, we do not wait another year. So this year in October, all diesel vehicles with an emission standard worse than six are banned from the Munich city center. So basically, you are not longer able for personal traffic to go with your diesel car in the Munich city center. The until that, you have some exceptions for public transportation. But finally, next year, there are also these expectations in these areas will be omitted. So you see that it is really urgent to change fast and to improve the current development processes for electrical vehicles. Wow, that's interesting. Rod, can you explain the most significant market driver and why our listeners should care? Well, you know, th there are many different market drivers. I think, though, for this audience here, their interest might be 
what's going on with design tools and the workflows associated with designing these kinds of products. The first thing that comes to mind is these kinds of products are going to require a simulation design process. At the semiconductor device level, right, we're already seeing a growth of easily over 25% CAGR through the end of 26 as well. And in the past, you know, uh, the power modules that we've been talking about, they have been using traditional silicon-based IGPT circuits. These technologies have been available for many years, and the manufacturing processes are mature, but the device cost is, is lower for those. And what we're seeing now is a, a whole new investment that's going around um, modern wide band gap semiconductors like silicon carbide and gallium nitride. And as a result, new investments in fab lines to support that is increasing. Uh, a major investment in this area are in the billions of dollars to offer um, the upcoming demand for both silicon carbide and gallium nitride. So it's a rapidly changing environment from an investment standpoint, from a, a technology standpoint. And as the demand continues to grow for these e-mobility applications, either silicon carbide seems to be the best suited for this main or traction inverter that we've talked about, this electrified drivetrain. Although gallium nitride is also finding n nice niches in the area of charging stations and onboard chargers and things like this. So when we look at the market, right, there are different kinds of converter types that are part of an you know, electric vehicle. As I mentioned, the traction inverters themselves represent a $19 billion market by itself, and it accounts for over 60% of the total electric vehicle converter market. So by focusing on these traction inverters, right, it seems to be like this is a, the, the biggest area or the biggest opportunity for folks that are looking at providing uh, design flows and design tools uh, to meet this need. When we look at the end applications, you know, whether it's a, a battery uh, operated vehicle, a hybrid and, and so forth, right? Again, we're looking at electrified drivetrains. And this is really where uh, a lot of the investment, a lot of the interest is being focused today. And power modules are at the, at, at the center of that attention. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Wilfred, can you explain why this topic is so complex? If you start design for uh, the power module, the designer must select one of many technologies. Just to mention two, you have the traditional, the silicon, the IGBT, or you have the silicon carbide MOSFET. So the designer has to solve a polylemma based on the requirements on the power module. And I just want to mention a couple of these design challenges to achieve. The complex requirements like high voltage resistivity and mainstream that currently is 1700 volt. There are silicon carbides that in the market supporting 3300 volts and higher. You have in the same chip high current ratings up to 1600 ampere. And of course, with the requirement, you need to be temperature stable and you want to have low emissions of E and H fields. So this podcast will also highlight some of the design methods today and their advantages. And finally, we will uh, the outline the holistic design and verification flow, which is our proposal in this broadcast. It's interesting, especially when you're talking about 1700 volts or 1600 amps with the, you know temperature stability and low E and H field emission requirements. That's, that's a lot to deal with when you, when you really step back and take a look at what's going on there. Wilfred, you mentioned different technologies. Can you give us a short technology overview? As mentioned, when a power module design is started, we already learned that a designer needs to consider different technical aspects. So first, a designer uh, can choose between these semiconductor technologies. And the typical, we have the silicon, silicon carbide, or the gallium nitride, starting just with the transistor technology. So without simulation, the only the pure data sheet values and the price help to make a decision. For the substrate, for example, itself, multiple technologies are available. The most common technologies are direct the copper bonds or a short form DCB. There are the alternatives like active metal pricing. Of course, each technology comes with different design rules such as spacing, the placement of dimples to form thermal transfer zones, and electric and thermal parasitics. 
you can see without simulation, a lot of experience is required to do the best decisions. Also a couple of design challenges which build the contradicting requirements are available, which leads without simulation to a high number of physical prototypes. In the end, the substrate must get manufactured, which is a problem on itself. Oh yeah, I, I can imagine. Rod, I'm wondering how the industry is dealing with those challenges today. That's actually the opportunity we have because as Wilfried uh, mentioned, you know, what we have found is the workflows that have been put in place today are really a, a mixture of manual methods, tribal knowledge of how things are put together. And in some cases, you know, many customers do use some form of, of simulation, but not nearly at the level that uh, we think that they need to be successful. So what ends up happening when they design these modules, they use whatever flow that they have, but it's typically really dependent on getting to a physical prototype, something that they can measure. What we have found is that, that this process is very elongated. It involves um, you know, disjointed tools along the way. There's data integrity problems of moving data from one point in the flow to another. And it takes a long time for these uh, prototypes to be, uh, be created. And we found that you know, having a dozen or more prototypes is not uncommon. So you can imagine in a fast moving market like electric vehicles, creating a module that uh, would take you know, several months is a problem, right? You know, they like to have a new uh, model out every year or even sooner. And uh, without having the electrified drivetrain kind of figured out as part of that, the module being a big part of that, that creates a lot of problems. So this error prone workflow that we have found with multi-vendor software, this complex tool data import, this is the opportunity that we see of providing a solution that would automate a lot of those processes and reduce the time it takes to get to a, uh, a, you know, a working physical prototype that can then be passed off into manufacturing. So, so that's the benefit, right? That's the value to the uh, customers that are looking at the solution that we have today. What you initially described, Rod, you know, it doesn't sound ideal. What is the impact on the customers? As I mentioned, right, you know, the time it takes to get to these uh, physical prototypes, it, it's taking too long. So there's time to market issues. There's costs involved, engineering costs for the design of the, of the module itself, the prototyping costs. So from that standpoint, right, they're looking at trying to, as best they can through this dependence on physical prototyping, to address, you know, life cycle kind of demands, reliability kind of demands that where these modules end up in the electric vehicle. As part of the electrified drivetrain, right, these are deeply embedded within these uh, vehicles. And you can imagine if something like this would fail uh, a year or two down the road, trying to get that repaired in the field is a very costly and kind of proposition for the end customer. So there's a lot of time spent on trying to meet all the design objectives, to understand what the life cycle reliability issues associated with these modules and uh, to actually uh, start to think about how we can improve that by using simulation to maybe explore more of the design space to improve the overall uh, performance of the module itself, increase its durability and reliability. This is the power module integrated flow that we have. It's a, really an integrated digital thread that enables these customers to drastically reduce the, the prototype engineering cost and reduce the time to market. So it's a win-win for them as well. That's great. Can you explain what is novel with uh, your approach? You know, Rod, when you think about that? As I mentioned earlier, right, seems like every customer has a slightly different way uh, of doing this, but there's an awful lot of know-how that's involved in, in creating these modules in the first place. And it's disjointed, right? The tools are disjointed and, and so forth. So our approach is to provide a really seamless, integrated design process targeted directly at power module design. And this is really what the value is for the end customer that's looking at improving their overall design process. You know, for regular attendees in this podcast, you know, using an integrated ECAD uh, process is their daily, you know, bread and butter, uh, so to speak. Can you describe the tool landscape required for power module design? We put together a start with uh, Expedition Designer and the EDM library. And the, honestly speaking, the schematic for such a power module looks pretty simple. So you have just a half bridge, for example, it's just a couple of components, but still the interactive alignment and informal reuse the method in this schematic can help 
to accelerate um, the schematic creation process. More important here is the integration of our multi-language server supporting uh, SPICE, VHDL, AMS, C code, and the other languages to ensure that the pure electrical circuit works. And here, of course, there are also the devices itself or the components. They come up with some the component parasitics like the casing inductance and so on. And if you can perform a good pre-layout simulation with Expedition AMS, you can ensure that the product will work un uh, under ideal conditions. So for this reason, user uh, can perform their waveform the analysis using like uh, the modern scope with the waveform the analyzer that even in this stage, the design can be optimized. And for example, you put in some shunt resistors and so on to get some valuable data out of your module. Of course, for the layout part, it's more like a package. If we talk about 1,700 volt and 1,600 amperes. So for this reason, uh, Expedition layout needs the advanced the package options. So this is really a must-have for the power model the implementation, which is currently done in the industry mainly with mechanical tools. The main advantage is that bond wires are parameterizable objects which can be placed interactively. This 3D view and its the capabilities to import mechanical enclosures help to check and optimize the bond wire placement. The good thing about this while doing the bond wire placement the interactively, a 2D and 3D design rule check ensures a correct by construction approach. In addition, the layout designer gets information on bond wire lengths, angle, and so on at the fingertips, which ensure the manufacturability. You know, as a, a very seasoned and experienced uh, PCB designer, you know, I, I get it. This sounds very comprehensive for the design aspect, but what about the design verification? So if you want to verify power modules, you need Hyperlink's advanced solver to simulate, for example, stray inductance of a whole module or current density. With this, the number of bond wires needed is no longer a guessing game. And the system architecture can already predict the overshoot of a module by multiplying the current di by dt with the strain inductance. And you can put these values in your data sheet, or you can provide these values to your end customers. A typical load case of 1,700 volt and 1,000 amps, we already hear these numbers a lot in this podcast, can be easily applied to a power module. Imagine you want a new engineer or a student test a physical prototype with these values. This is also a kind of risk mitigation, especially if you assume issues with your power module. So you have some good visualization, the methods uh, that helps to find the current, the bottlenecks and to ensure an even current distribution. With the full wave solver, you can also calculate uh, H and E fields. This helps to optimize the power module behavior in a real world environment. So if you have a really, really high uh, integration in an electrical motor with the gate driver board and of course the controller board. Another uh, advantage here is of the simulating A, E and H fields is the maximum field strength. So just imagine these power modules are filled with a dielectric uh, geo, and the geo has a maximum field strength to withstand. And you need to ensure that you do not exceed a certain field strength threshold so that you uh, avoid a uh, breakdown. You know, Wilfred, I understand uh, that you have a streamlined process for design to post layout verification. Do you have a solution to close the loop between pre and post layout verification? Yes. So in some cases, we call the pre-layout simulation also executable specification. So this means, and I defined it like this, pre-layout simulation is your ideal case. And after that, the designer 
is taking care about the implementation of the substrate, the uh, placement of bond wires, the placement of components, and so on. And of course, this is not included in the pre-layout sim simulation. This leads to the final steps that electrical parasitics between all component pins can be automatically back annotated to Expedition Designer and AMS. This level of information enables the hardware engineer to simulate the design regarding its actual switching characteristics in a static and dynamic state. The waveform can be uh, used to calculate uh, static and dynamic switching losses, which then can be used in the thermal simulation with low EFD. Expedition AMS can read parasitic elements such as Spice circuits are uh, also defined as lumped elements, R, L, C, and Gs, S parameter, Z parameter, and Y parameters. The good thing is that these parameters even can come from measurement. So if you have your physical prototype in place, you do your measurements, you can even put these values into Expedition AMS. So the intelligent netlisting process embeds all these parasitics automatically without touching the schematic. So this ensures data integrity, which is absolutely important for such a development process. I agree, I agree with that intelligence. In the beginning, you know, you mentioned polylemma. Until now, we have just talked about the electric domain. Can you give us some more insights into what you're doing with a the thermal and mechanical? So this is a great question. For the thermal simulation, the power values for each device can be extracted from the last simulation with the parasitics. These values allow us to perform a thermal simulation, for example, in flow EFD, which is uh, cut embedded, for example, in NX, and it's a multi-purpose CFD the simulation tool. At the power module or the whole inverter system, including a heatsink, can be used as a basis, since only the conductive heat transfer is necessary and important for this design, a simulation, and a parametric study can be performed extremely fast. Of course, it is possible to enhance this simulation with full fluidic uh, domain, the properties like a fluid heatsink and so on. But at the beginning, it's enough for a case rated or a design rated power module to have the conductive heat transfer only. Can you combine the thermal and electric domain? Yes, so the thermal behavior can be tied together by exporting a so-called BCI ROM model. So it's a boundary condition independent reduced order model from Flow EFD, which leads to a full electro simultaneous simulation in Expedition AMS. And also in this case, the PCI ROM model, which is then exported in a format in VHDL AMS, can be fully embedded in the netlist or in the schematic. That basically, this combined simulation finally shows the full dynamic thermal behavior of the power module. Rod, can you explain how your flow can increase reliability and robustness? I think Wilfrey kind of touched on a couple of these topics, right? You know, this idea of electrothermal as a single kind of design process as well as the thermal mechanical. But the, the, the key or the secret to kind of making this work is being able to do this early in the design process at a time when you actually have the you know, ability to make those changes to the physical design. So that, you know, it doesn't propagate down the rest of the workflow and end up in a situation that's going to cause a problem later on. This technology around thermal mechanical or electrothermal consideration is integrated as part of the whole flow. Flow EFD being a big part of pulling that all together. So being able to verify, you know, various mechanical stresses between the copper and the substrate, the solder layers, you know, trying to predict at what point you're going to have failures due to like bond wires popping off because of thermal stress and uh, cycling that goes on. These devices turn on and turn off. They, they get hot, they get cool. And as you can imagine, you know, there's a variety of different thermals and electrical stresses um, that have to be accounted for. So, so we see this in all throughout the flow uh, in, in different pieces of the flow. So again, this is kind of the, the thing that we went after in terms of trying to put the solution together is to attack these problems, which uh, you know, designers are dealing with today. 
Interesting. You know, how would you conclude your current achievements? Compared to the weekly link design flow, we saw that using uh, Siemens products that enable a seamless digital thread for the whole power module design process, reducing costly interactions and development is only one advantage of such a highly integrated working method, accelerating and optimizing the design without using physical prototypes using simulation that only helps to improve cross-domain product reliability even further. So this single vendor approach guarantees a simplification of all the process steps needed to design a power module due to a highly automated multidiscipline verification. Very interesting indeed. Rod, can you summarize the power module design challenges on a system level? This is true for all of electronics products, but reducing the size of a component, you know, higher levels of component integration is, is one of the key ones. From a power module standpoint, the trends that we're seeing there are things like circuits that were once separate, like uh, gate driver circuits or controller boards, over time will be integrated as part of the power module. So higher levels of integration and making things a lot smaller, more efficient. Thereby, you know, that also reduces the weight of the, of the overall system. And that tends to increase, you know, like things like the vehicle range, which is a, a key factor. You know, reducing the power conversion losses, making it extending the range for, for vehicles, the longevity, the performance, the cooling requirements that are, that are uh, implied here. Now, all of these things kind of all converge on the, on the same thing. As, as you reduce the, the size of these components, everything seems to scale, right? The amount of power that's required, the amount of cooling that's required. And as a result, uh, you know, reduces the infield fair costs as, as a result by increasing the reliability and durability of these, of these critical components. So in summary, right, we're looking at really trying to, as part of the, the power module design process, is address this electrical symmetry and thermal symmetry problem um, as part of the layout process. And by doing that, these are all the different things that uh, I just uh, mentioned here are, are, the, are the things that fall out of that process. We've talked a lot about uh, tools and processes. Can you please summarize the Siemens digital thread? So we can put this together in, uh, let's say, four main areas. So the first one is the workflow. The second one is the pre-layout modeling. The third one is design authoring. And this includes uh, enclosure, the circuit, the layout. And the fourth area is the tight integration uh, with the post layout and the verification. So this basically means that the integrated digital thread that enable a high automated streamlined design process, adopting uh, the thread reduces the prototyping and lab time costs while accelerating the time to pass the final electrical and thermal sign off. The number of design derivatives uh, start with some form of design reuse, which basically means uh, it's not longer required to start from scratch every time, including uh, subsystem models for motors, cable, and thermal. Pre-layout modeling that enables the designer to expand the search space for a suitable layout that meets all the module performance requirements. And there can be no real comparison uh, when it comes to how the designer intent is documented. And mechanical cut or drawing tool versus a schematic driven layout flow. So it's completely different. So you cannot mix uh, flows up. The lack of electrical connectivity, device modeling and footprint make the Siemens approach a game changer. So the thinking in the MCAT and in the ECAT world is completely different. We have the advantage that we have all the tools in-house. So the synchronization between the mechanical tool NX and the ECAT tool Expedition enables rapid transition from layout to electrical extraction or layout to some of the analysis and modeling. This is an excellent example of how the overall workflow is streamlined. And finally, the digital thread post layout performance verification a portion opens the customer ability to explore more of the available design space for a reasonable layout solution. So just imagine that currently, if you build up your prototypes, 
So you are satisfied as soon as you reach the requirements, but this does not mean that you have the most optimized solution, right? So faster the iteration results in higher the simulation the coverage that reduces risk and helps to improve the module durability, life cycle, and reliability. I agree. You know, having everything in one ecosystem is definitely a huge advantage and a game changer, you know, what Siemens offers. You know, Wilfred, any final thoughts uh, you want to share with our audience? The designers, the companies, suppliers are responsible for creating high quality, safe, sustainable products up to the standards uh, both the regulators and consumers demand, protecting the customers while reducing a social and environmental negative impact. The electronic manufacturers and designers have a role in this in initiative within our industry. The importance of environmentally uh, responsible electronic design will only grow as a green the consciousness developments among customers and governments. While numerous considerations are necessary for creating safe and sustainable products, it is essential to consider them from the start. The product design, material, number of parts, size of the device, and reasonable supplier, among others. Shift left with integrated validation to accelerate cycle time, increase reliability, reduce risk, and cost. A multi-domain uh, digital integrated approach to product design reduces non-compliance risk. It also reduces delay and cost, the overrun, and improves the product safety, quality, reliability by providing a structured design process, the analyze and verification of design intent throughout the development process, focus on the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle to keep the design for end of life and the forefront, the integrated or uh, the environmental data with product data and each phase of the product development process. Using separate disjoint the application for product design, simulation, and manufacturing no longer works. The isolating those activities greatly discourage the innovation while slowing a product time to market. So in the power the module design process, uh, we see that the organizations find that mistakes may be not identified early in the design process because the current solutions are limited to 2D displays and techniques. The collaboration issues and that slows down the design process. And this is the expensive part of the development process. In this time that we've had together, the three of us with uh, Rod, you and Rod, we've covered a lot of content. And I feel, and I'm sure you, you both feel, is it's really great content. And we can, I think we can easily go another two hours uh, talking about this uh, with the passion that we have. And we covered a lot of topics on power electronics, specifically regarding power modules. I want to thank uh, you, uh, Rod and Wilford, for your invaluable insights that you provided and shared with uh, not just myself, but with the audience today. I wanted to thank everybody for listening to the podcast, and I agree. Uh, it, it is an exciting area, and uh, it's very fast-moving, full of technology. So hopefully everybody uh, has learned something today from listening to it. Most definitely. Wilfred, any, any last closing? But thank you for your time. I'm looking forward to work with the one of you listeners in the future. Awesome. So to our audience, thanks for tuning in, and I hope you keep following along for more industry content such as you know what we discussed today and PCB design best practices. <music>